Good morning, everybody. Hey, it's great to see all of you here. Welcome to Foundations Church, and you're here with us, and we're humbled by that. Thank you for being here. We always hope this is an invigorating time, so we're really glad you're here. Thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, if you're a first-time person here, we want to say a special hello to you and shake my hand on the way out. I, I always like meeting newcomers. If you've been here for a while, just, just welcome by, okay? So um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, okay? And our, we have a connecting table in the back that tells you all the things that are going on at Foundations Church connecting table. That, that, that'll help you figure out all the moving parts. Um, just one or two quick things. Every year we rent out the Chilson Center. Tonight was that night, but we had to cancel. We didn't have to. Chilson called us up like just a day or two ago and says we can't pull it off. So we apologize for that if you were planning. That's always a fun event. People bring family and friends and neighbors and we pack out the place, but we, it's not our fault. We just couldn't pull it off. They just couldn't pull it off for us. We'll, we'll do a rain check and make that happen again. But if you go to Chilson tonight, um, you're not going to get in. Okay, it'll be closed. Okay. Also, um, I'm leaving, but 48 of us are leaving for Israel tomorrow. So that's exciting. We're really excited about that. So uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, hopefully next weekend, I think we got all this figured out, we're going to live stream on our service. We'll just say hello to you, okay? We'll just say hello. We'll be, we'll be at like the Dead Sea, I think, at that time. So I'll, I'll be in my swimsuit and we'll just... Uh, that ain't going to happen, all right? All right, so, um, so anyway, we're, we'll, we'll just say hello to you, but that's good. So we're, we're really glad you're here. We're in a series called um, Stuck, and stuck is a big deal. And when you feel stuck in life, at least I do, when I feel stuck in life, my heart gets discouraged. My heart gets discouraged. And so, so we're, we're, we'll talk about that today. Um, sometimes people come up to you and say this, um, I have some good news and some bad news. And then they always follow it up with this question. Which, good, good. How many people want the bad news first? It's the majority. How many people want the good news first? Just a few. Yeah, I, I, I'm a bad news first person, but I got to rethink the strategy. Because I, I thought, like, if I hear the bad news first, then I'll end on a good note. But usually the bad news spins me out so bad I don't even hear the good news, so I got to think that through. Well, today I'm really glad you're here, because we're going to have, we're going to talk about bad news and we're going to talk about good news, and I get to choose which comes first, okay? And today we're going to start out with bad news first. I'm going to tell you some bad news, okay? But I hope that when I share the good news, the good news will be so compelling, so powerful, that we won't even mind the bad news because we're so looking forward to the good news, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're in a series called Stuck. When I get stuck, as I mentioned before, and my heart gets discouraged. And I was thinking about that because about a month or two ago, I was just had a bad, ran into like a bad week or something. It seemed like everything was just going bad. And it's like, ah, oh, I felt like I was sinking, 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 and my heart was just sinking. Did you ever have that happen? It's like, ah. And then I ran into this verse. And, 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 and so we're going to talk about what happens when our heart gets discouraged. We're going to look at one verse. We'll look at more, but this is a main verse. I invite you all to stand. I'll read the white. You read the yellow. This is from Luke chapter 18. Jesus is about to tell a parable, but before the parable is this first verse in chapter 18. I'll read the white. You read the yellow. Jesus was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to and now here is, he puts a dynamic in front of us. Pray, and if you pray, you won't lose heart. If you don't pray, you're going to lose heart. That's the equation. So today, if you're here and, and, you're, and you're losing heart, well, we got some good news for you. The way out of doing that is to pray. So pray, okay? So, so if I don't pray, my heart's going to get discouraged. If I pray, I can encourage and strengthen my heart. We're going to do cardio work today, okay? We're going to strengthen our heart. Now, the, the good news is, is if you pray, you won't lose heart. But here's the bad news for me. I'm not a good prayer. I don't pray very well. The other day, my wife and kids were gone. I said, I'm going to spend an hour in prayer. So they left, and I knelt down by the couch. I said, I guess I'll start by praising God. You know, God, you're good. You're amazing. You're awesome. Thank you, God. You're, you're just incredible. Thank you. You're, you're good. You're fantastic. You're great. <laughs> wow, 30 seconds. Oh, boy. That's, I, I, I'm in trouble now. I'm in trouble. So, so family, family, family. I pray, pray, pray for my wife, Vicki. Pray, pray bl 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 bless her. And, and then my oldest daughter, Monica, she's a single mom. And I pray for her. Sometimes I, I hurt for her so bad. Sometimes I don't even pray. I just, like, moan. Oh, I hurt for her. Oh, Monica. Terry, Terry's in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. You've put her in a good spot. Thank you, God. Bless Terry. And Caleb, 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 bless, bless Caleb. And, and, and Luke, 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 bless, bless, just bless Luke. 
wow, two minutes, okay? Wow, this, this is going to be tough. Well, I'm a pastor. Better pray for foundations. Pray, pray for this church. It's really in trouble because of the senior pastor. It's got some problems and issues. And that, that's not funny, all right? I'm telling you my prayer life here, okay? You don't laugh at it. And then so he, he screwed up. And the church, how can a church go anywhere with him? And uh, uh, then I start writing a do list. Cut the grass. No, this is prayer, prayer, prayer time, prayer time, okay? Okay, okay, prayer, okay? Three minutes. I'm three minutes in. Well, I've read in the Bible that some people pray laying down. So I got up off my knees and laid down on the couch. I took a 57-minute nap. And I want to tell you something. When I woke up, I was so refreshed. That, just, that was just so refreshing. Okay? So today we're going to talk about how not to lose our heart. But, but we don't, some of us don't know how to pray, so we're going to talk about that today. But before we do any of that, we have to ask God to help us. Okay? So let's bow forward to prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for every person here. And thank you that you're a God who doesn't want us to lose heart. And that's hard in this world. Job responsibilities, financial responsibilities, kids and marriage and health and oh, all those things, man, it makes it really, really challenging. So today, Father, our prayer is the same thing the disciples did when they went to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray because <laughs> we want to leave here today with a strong heart. So be with all of us this morning for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may grab a seat, okay? So in the 19th century, there was this pastor in London uh, some people say he was the greatest pastor in the world. I don't know how you do that, but that's what they said. He pastored a church called the Metropolitan Tabernacle. His name was Charles Spurgeon. People still read his sermons today. He was a powerful, led a dynamic church in London, England. Not only was he an eloquent and powerful preacher, but they said he could pray like no others. When he prayed, heaven and earth just shook. Well, he was walking in London one day, and he saw a bunch of kids running around. And there was an orphan problem. And so he says, we need an orphanage. That's what we need. We need an orphanage. So while he was walking, he saw this big house in London for sale. He said, that would be perfect. He walked in. There was a real estate agent there. He says, how much do you want for this house? And the agent gave him a price. And Charles Spurgeon said, I'm prepared today to pay you half that. And the agent said, that's insulting. There's no way my client would take that. No way. I mean, no way. You're, you're wasting my time. That's insulting, that offer. No, no way. There's no way. No way. Get out of here. And the guy, Spurgeon, wrote down his name and number and said, if you change your mind, let me know. So later that day, the owner of the house called the agent and said, how's it going? He says, well, we only had one guy stop by, some stupid idiot guy. He came by and offered you half. The owner was insulting. He goes, how can he do that? Who would be dumb enough to do that? And the guy says, well, I have his name. We go, who is he? He goes, uh, Spurgeon. Char and the guy on the phone says, the, the, the Charles Spurgeon came in? He goes, that's what it says here. The, the, the pastor, the metropolitan, the Charles Spurgeon offered half? Call him up right now and tell him we'll take it. Because the way that guy prays, we're liable to give it to him for free. <laughs> That's how we pray. I mean, that, that's, that's, that, I don't pray that way. When someone offers this much, I end up paying more usually. It's like, how did that happen? Spurgeon had this amazing, amazing ability to, to pray and things move, but, but I, 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 don't, I don't pray like that. I, I, I just don't pray like that. I get tired. I do do lists. I fall. I, I, I don't have words. On Wednesdays, we have staff meeting like every other one, twice a month or something, and at the end of staff meeting, we take prayer requests and then we pray. And like a couple months ago, during staff meeting prayer, I fell asleep. <laughs> now, if you walked into our staff meeting, you'd see all these people intense praying. You'd see one guy doing this. <laughs> and you'd say, who's that guy? Oh, that's our senior pastor. Yeah, he, he's, he's really into it, man. He's, 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 he's devoted, man. That guy is into it, all right? It's like, I, I, I'm, I'm not that good. I'm not that good at praying. I'm just, I'm just not that good. So today, I'm going to give you bad news and good news, okay? If you're ready to go, say, I'm ready. Pray. Bad news. Here's the bad news. Bad news, none of us know how to pray. 
Oh, Carl, don't be so judgmental. Don't be so judgmental. I lead a prayer meeting. Good for you. You don't know how to pray. But my wife and I, we pray every night before we go to bed. Vicky and I used to try that. I'd fall asleep. No, seriously, we don't try it. She got mad. I would fall asleep during my time to prayer. I go, dear God, I pray for it. <laughs> She'd say, are you waiting on God? And, oh, you're sleeping. <laughs> so we don't even pray. But, but you go, well, we pray, we pray, we pray for our family. Yeah, good, good for you. But, but, but here's the bad news. You don't know how to pray. How can you be so judgmental? Don't blame me. No emails this week. If you have a problem with what I just said, email the Apostle Paul. Okay? Because here's what the, maybe the greatest Christian who's ever lived. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 26. I read the white. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness for? Let's try it again. For? As we should. He says, we don't know how to pray. He, he doesn't say you. He includes himself in this. He says, we don't know how to pray. The great Apostle Paul. Bad news is, none of us here know how to pray. We don't know how to pray. Now, when I took my first church, I was 28 years old in a small town in Iowa. They should have never hired me. I had no clue what I was doing at 28. I still don't, but at 28, I really didn't. And on Wednesday nights, they had a prayer meeting. So I'm pastor, so I go. There was one lady who would come, and all she did during the prayer meeting was cry for her son. That's all she did. She just cried for her son. That's all she just, just cried. Cried for her son. The other lady was an elderly lady, and all she prayed for was that God would forgive us because the church is going to hell in a handbasket. It's like, lady, I'm the pastor of the church. Okay, help me out. We're going to hell, God. It's like, oh, jeez. And then one man showed up. He lived as a, this is true, he lived as a hermit all by himself in the woods. He looked like ZZ Top. Okay, or one of the Duck Dynasty dudes. Come with a long beard. And that was prayer meeting and me. They'd come, pastor, how come more people don't come to prayer meeting? Are you kidding me? This is like the worst prayer meeting on planet Earth. I wouldn't come to this thing if I wasn't pastor, okay? It was awful. It was just awful. Well, the lady who cried for her son all the time, I knew her son, and she should have cried for her son. He was in trouble all the time. He was in trouble. Now, when he was, in high, when he was out of high school, because he got kicked out of high school, he didn't graduate, he got involved in the occult, and he read stuff by Anton LaVey. You know who Anton LaVey is? He's head of the satanic church. And evidently, he and three buddies, they'd always hang out in a cemetery, okay? And evidently, the rumor was that they went out in a cemetery and had some occult satanic ritual, and all of them invited demons into their life. You can't make this up. This is Iowa, okay? All right? And this kid was a terror. Everybody, I knew him. Everyone was afraid of this kid. I mean, this kid was strong as an ox. He had biceps. He had biceps, and he had scars all over his body because he just had self-destructive tendencies. Ride his motorcycle in the bar. I mean, just was, he was awful. He broke into our church, tried to set our church on fire, turned every cross upside down, took spray paint and cussed on the walls, and went to the bathroom in the church, number one and number two. Okay? He was a tough kid. The, it wasn't hard to catch him. The police knew who it was. Right? Okay? And so they, they brought, we, we didn't press charges. I knew the kid. I was afraid of him. That's why. Okay? And I wasn't a good guy. I was afraid of him. He said, yeah, he'll kill me if I press charges. All right? So, so no charges. Okay? Later, I get a call from the police. This is like maybe a year later. The police says <laughs> there's a hostage situation in town. They go, you need to come. I'm 28 years old. You need to come and negotiate. What? <laughs> It was him. It was a kid. He had a woman in his house with a rifle and said he was going to kill her. And he wouldn't talk to anybody but dear old Pastor Carl. Why me? Why me? Okay, all right? Okay. So the cops picked me up and drive me to the scene. It was, it was intimidating because there was SWAT all over on top of the roofs of the houses. And they put me in the house next to him and put me on the phone. We'll call him Billy. We'll just call him Billy. Hey, Billy, what are you doing? Uh, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Hey, you got to calm down, dude. You're going to be in trouble. You, know, you already are in trouble. Okay? And, uh, and so, so I talked to him, and I don't know what I even said, but he, ended, he agreed that I could come in with a couple cops, and they arrested him and put him, took him away and put him in jail. Well, when he got out of jail, we still have prayer meeting every Wednesday, and she would sit here and cry the whole time. Okay? 
So when he got out of jail, the good thing about jail is if you're hooked on drugs and alcohol, it cleans you up for the most part. Okay, so he came out, maybe not. Not the jail you were in. Okay, yeah, okay, but, okay, 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 okay. Law enforcement here. That's all right, okay. They're a little jaded. We'll get over it, okay? All right, all right so um, where was I? Oh, he came out clean. He came out clean, and, uh, and uh, he told his mom he wants the demon out of him. So she comes to prayer meeting and says, hey, Pastor Carl, Billy wants the demon out of him. I go, really? She goes, you know, Jesus prayed demons out of people. Oh, yeah, I read that all the time. She goes, now you have to pray demons out of them. <laughs> Can you do that, Pastor? I went to a liturgical church, okay? You couldn't sneeze unless it was in the bulletin, okay? I mean, you couldn't do anything. <laughs> and so, you want me to what? She goes, you, uh, we, 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 we got to get the demon. He wants the demon out. We, he wants the demon out of him. Can, 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 can you help him? I go, uh, 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 yeah, as a pastor, how, you can't say no to that, right? Okay, so I quickly ran to my Pentecostal friend, okay? And I says, you got to help me out, dude. He goes, what? I go, well, I got to cast a demon out. I don't know how to do it. You got some books on that thing? Okay, and so, so I go, I go well, you need to come with me. And he goes, what? I go, I need some Pentecostal in there, somebody who knows this. I'm, 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 I'm a liturgical guy. I don't know. And so, and so I don't know. Here, here's the bad news. <coughs> Billy wants the demon out of him, and Billy wants me to pray for the demon out of him. Here's the bad news. I don't know how to do it. That's the bad news. Are you all with me today? I have no good get me out demon prayer. Okay? Don't have one. Don't have one. That's the bad news. I, I don't know what to do about this situation. This is, this is going to be bad. This is going to be a bad situation. I don't know how to pray to get rid of this demon. The apostle Paul backs me up on this and says, none of us know how to pray. None of us. Bad news, none of us know how to pray. Here's the good news. The good news is, God helps us to pray. God helps us. Here is the good news. Ephesians 3.20. If, if you're a diligent student, your homework assignment is, memorize this verse. It's a good one. You'll need it. Here it is. I read the white. You read the yellow. Now to God, who is able to do far more abundantly, all, yeah. or think, according to the power that works within us. Here, here's what this verse says. Carl, bad news is you don't know how to pray. Get me out demon prayer, okay? Good news is God will take your words and he'll push it beyond what you could imagine or think. One more time. To him who's able far more abundantly, all that, yeah. <laughs> or think. according to, God will take our cruddy prayers that we don't know how to pray and he'll push them beyond what we could imagine or think or ask. Bad news, we don't know how to pray. Good news is the Holy Spirit in us helps us take our mere cruddy words and take them to God and makes them even better than we could imagine, think, or ask. Are you all with me today? That's what God does. He goes beyond our ask. It takes the pressure off of me. It takes the pressure off of me because it's not me anymore. It's up to God. Uh, this week, I guess in May, the first week of May is National Prayer Day, and they do something here in Loveland. Last year, they asked me, they called me, I said, Pastor Carl, would you come to the day of prayer? I go, I'll come to it. They go, but we want you to be one of the main prayers. I go, oh boy, here we go again. You can't say, no, your pastor. Okay? So I go, what do you want me to pray? Well, this guy's praying for education. This guy's praying for law enforcement. Thank goodness they need it. Okay, all right? Okay. This guy, can you pray community prayer? I'm thinking, I have no good community prayer. I have no good. But you can't say no. So I says, okay. So I get there. Folks, I have a 19-inch neck. My brother mocks me every time he sees me, okay? Okay, he goes, your head stands on your shoulders, okay? So I don't like wearing ties because I can't wear a shirt. And when I wear a shirt with a tie, I just feel like I'm going to choke the whole time, okay? So I go there and I just wear a shirt, nice pants, and I wear a jacket. I'm the only guy on the platform without a tie. That's so they could recognize the dude who doesn't know how to pray, okay? Uh, the guy without the tie, okay? And so it's time for, now Pastor Carl's going to come and do a community prayer. I'm walking up there. I don't have anything prepared. Dear God, I have no good community prayer. And I start going, uh, dear Father, uh, 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 and I don't know. But I just prayed and said amen. They called me up a month ago and said, hey, we're having, we're having, we're having day of prayer day. I think it's May 4th. So God must have done something, right? Because they asked me back. <laughs> Can you come in? No, I'm in Israel. Thank God I got a good out on this one. I got an out, baby. You can't argue with that one. I got an out, okay? So the bad news is we don't know how to pray. 
The good news is the Holy Spirit and God helps us to pray. So, we're in my office. Here it is, Billy, the demon guy. Mike, the Pentecostal guy. And Billy wants to demon. Now, by the way, but let me just say this before I begin. I know with most of you, I have zero, hardly any credibility. This story will take care of the rest of it for sure, okay, all right? So, so I, I'm, not, I, I'm not telling you this. I, all I'm gonna tell you is the facts, okay? I don't have a category for this. This has only happened like twice in my 25-year ministry. This is the first time. So this is just something that found me. I don't find it. I don't have a category for it. If you think I'm crazy, probably true. Stand in line with everybody else, okay? And if you don't think this is true, call Mike in Keokuk, Iowa. I haven't talked to him in 25 years. That was my Pentecostal friend. Talk to Mike, and he'll corroborate everything that I'm saying today. Okay? So there's no category for this. This just happened. This is just facts. So I go, okay, all right, so here we are. Billy, how you doing? I want the demon out of me. Okay, okay, good. Okay, well, Mike, you good? The Pentecostal dude folds under pressure. Okay, you're the pastor. You take charge. That's why you're here, all right? Okay, okay, all right. Well, Billy, you went, okay, so let, let's start with a word of prayer. I go, okay, dear God, we're here today. Billy has a demon in him, and uh, if it be your will, Billy stops me. Pastor, how could it not be God's will to get the demon out of me? That's a good point, Billy. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a you, you, you got a good point right there, okay? Okay, because here's the deal. I don't have no good get me out demon prayer, okay? All right, that's why, Billy. All right, work with me on this one, okay? He goes, of course it's God's will. So I said, okay. All right, so you want the demon out. Yes, we got that. Okay, you with me? I'm with you, but you lead. Oh, whatever, okay? All right. Okay, all right. So, so I start praying. I says, okay, God, um, here we are. Um, so it is your will. <laughs> um, and so uh, Billy has a demon in him, and, and, and Billy wants him out, and we want him out, and that's why we're here today. And so we're going to stand here in Jesus' name. Now, I'm not making this up. I look at Billy and his whole demeanor changes completely. He's sitting in a chair in my office with a short sleeve shirt. I can see the scars and his bulging biceps. And all of a sudden, his whole demeanor changes, and he gets this nasty look like a bulldog. I mean, I like bulldogs, but they don't look good. And so, you know, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he starts squeezing the chair. And he looked at me and, go, and he dropped the F-bomb. Blank you, Pastor! I'm, I, I have to go to the bathroom right now because I'm about what my pants, okay? <laughs> my Pentecostal friend goes, that's it! What? That's it! That's what? That's the demon! Oh! 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 What do I do? Get him out! I don't have a good get me out prayer! I don't know what to do! I read that book you gave me. I went, <laughs> okay, 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 Billy. He looked at me again with this bulldog look and said, blank you, F-bomb again, drop. Woo, he's serious, okay, um, okay. And so I said, so I just, I just prayed this prayer. I don't even remember word for word, but it was something like this. Okay, we're standing in the power and authority of Jesus Christ. We have no power over you, but Jesus does, does for the blood of Jesus. And his death on the cross, his resurrection, he, did, he defeated all powers on heaven and earth. He stands above all power, principalities. And so in the name of Jesus, we tell this demon, get out, get out. God, you tell that demon where to go. Get out. In the name of Jesus, not in my name. Get out, get out, get out. He squeezes the chair. His biceps are just bulging. He leans back in the chair. The chair falls over. He hits his head on the wall, and he's on the floor. I go, oh, great. I'm going to be on Judge Judy now. <laughs> okay, this is, just, this is just unbelievable. This is unbelievable. I'm going to be on Judge Judy. He's, he's, lay, he's laying on the floor, and then, and, then he, and, and then he gets up, and he sits back in the chair. He goes, thank you, Pastor. My Pentecostal friend goes, He's delivered! I go, I don't think so. <laughs> no, he is. He is. Look at him. I go, Billy, how are you feeling? He goes, Pastor, I'm delivered. I look at my Pentecostal. I go, hey, it works. You know, it, it, it works. It works. For, how did that happen? And, and from that day, Billy and I got involved um, in a Bible study. He stopped his self-destructive tendencies. And he started getting involved in mainstream society. And you know what? <laughs> Here's the bad news. I had no good get me out demon prayer. All I did was just panic and just say words. 
And God took my ignorant, cruddy, <coughs> just whatever make up on the moment words. And the Holy Spirit took them and took them above and beyond what we could imagine or think. Are you all with me, church? Okay, okay. Bad news, bad news. I don't have a prayer for deliverance. <laughs> Good news, God takes my cruddy deliverance prayer and takes it beyond what I'm going to even think or imagine and set Billy free on a new course of life. That's why William Cowper, a guy who wrote hymns in the 1700s, says this, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon their knees. So therefore, this is the key of what I want you to get today, the only way I fail in prayer is to not show up. The only way. The only way. You'll make do lists. You won't have the right words to say. You'll fall asleep in your prayer. But I'm urging and begging you today to bring whatever you have. Your cruddy, measly prayers because the Holy Spirit within God's children will take those things and he'll take them above and beyond what we can think or imagine. The only way I fail in prayer is not to ask God, is not to, is not to participate in it. And so we just got to pray. My, my son got in trouble the other day, a while back. And so I, I brought him in to my, I was at home and I says, hey, hey son, uh, what, what's going on? That's not acceptable here. It's just not acceptable. And so, son, let me, let me tell you something. You're a good kid. You really are. You're good. You're good. I'd blame you for his, as his teacher, but I, I'm not going to do that, okay? But, but uh, son, you, you're a good kid, and, and you know what? You, you have a good heart, but you have a problem, and I have the same problem. It's called sin. Everybody has this problem. And here's what I want you to know about this problem, son. A project, a promise, <laughs> a pastor, a priest, a program isn't going to fix it. The only thing that could fix this problem is Jesus himself. That's the only one. It's the only one. And I wrestle with my problem all the time. So that's the deal we have to deal with. We have to deal with sin. And the only way to deal with it is take it to Jesus. So right now I was in my study at home and I says, so right now I just, let's just pray for this. He goes, okay, Dad. And so he bows his head, and there's silence, and I'm just staring at him. And he's sitting there like this. And I said, you know, well? I go, yeah, well, you pray. Well, Dad, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to do this. I don't either. You're a pastor. Don't tell anybody, but I don't know how to do this, son. Okay? You got to do it. Like, out loud? Yeah. Yeah, you got to do it out loud right now. I'm not sure. Just do, just do whatever. You'll be fine. And God will take the prayers of a little boy. Are you all with me today? Prayer. He doesn't even know how to do it. I don't either. And I take it above and beyond what he can imagine or ask. Bad news. Here's the bad news. You don't know how to pray. I don't either. Good news is God does. The mighty prophet Elijah, who prayed and fire came down from heaven. <laughs> He got threatened by this wicked woman named Jezebel. Anybody ever hear of Jezebel? Huh? Jezebel was this wicked, uh, vulgar person, and she made a vow. She made a vow and said, I'm going to kill the prophet of God. Well, he got wigged out about that. He got wigged out. So let's see what he did. Let's see what the prophet of God who prayed for fire to come down from him. Let's see what the prophet did. And when Elijah saw that, he ran for his life, afraid of Jezebel and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there, and he went further into the wilderness. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree or juniper tree. And now he's behind all by himself, and now he's going to pray, and the Bible's going to show us his prayer. Bad news, bad news. The mighty prophet of God doesn't know how to pray. He's a prophet, though. I know. Bad news. He don't know how to pray. Listen to his prayer. And he prayed that he might die. And here's his prayer. The Bible records it for us. It's enough, God. Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Bad news. Mighty prophet of God doesn't know how to pray. Kill me 
It's his prayer. Next verse, watch what happens. That's his prayer. Then he lay down and slept under the juniper tree, and suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And there he looked, and there by his head was a what? It was a cake baked on coals on a jar of water. And so he ate, drank. He ate the cake, took a drink, and went back to sleep, lay down again. The angel came back, woke him up the second time, and said, Hey, eat the cake. Eat the cake because the journey is too great for you. Bad news. Prophet don't know how to pray. When he's scared, he prays to God, God, kill me, kill me. Good news is the Holy Spirit knows how to pray. Holy Spirit goes to God and says, God, he didn't mean kill, he meant cake. <laughs> That's what he meant. He meant cake, he didn't mean kill me, he meant cake me, okay? <laughs> Sometimes when life is going really bad and you think you should die, you know what you need? Good piece of cake. That's what you need, okay? It's a good piece. I underline this three times in my Bible, okay? Yeah, you're not depressed. You just need some good cake, baby. All right, that's what you need. Prophet. Prophet says, kill me. Holy Spirit takes his words and says, no, 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 God. No, no, no. He, he, he doesn't mean kill. He means cake. And so, and so while, while, he's, while, while, while he's praying and all caught up in his depression, I just want to die, God is up in heaven in the kitchen baking him a cake. <laughs> Are you all with me? Because God knows better than what we know, what we need. So the only thing we have to do is show up to prayer. Just show up. Just show up and say something. And God will take my cruddy prayers and he'll take them and he'll push them. He'll push them beyond what we can think, imagine, or even conceive. Here's the rest of verse 26, Romans 8, says this. In the same way, the Spirit also, what? What does the Spirit do? Helps our weaknesses, for we don't know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit, go ahead, but the Spirit. That was horrible. But the Spirit himself, the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Watch this. With groanings. Too deep for words. I get teary-eyed when I think about it. Because when I'm in my car, groaning for Monica, that's a great prayer. Are you all with me today? I'm praying. Ah! God, I hurt for her. I hurt. And God, I don't even know what to say. But God takes my groanings and takes them to his throne and says, here's what his dad, here's what Monica's dad is really saying. Some of you have lost loved ones. And you grieve and you groan. And God takes your groanings to the throne and says, here's what my brother or my sister really needs. I'm going to help him out. I, I, I'm going to help him out. Bad news. We don't know how to pray. Good news is the Holy Spirit in us knows how to. We say I can't and I don't. And the Holy Spirit says what they really mean is I will, I can and I will. The Holy Spirit takes my words and he edits them and spell checks them. He don't mean cake. I mean, he don't mean kill. He means cake. That's what he needs. That's what he needs. That, that's exactly what he needs. Thank, 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 thank God he doesn't answer all our prayers, right? Thank God. If he did, I would have married my third grade teacher, okay? Okay? Thank God. Thank God he doesn't do that. Okay, but he edits my prayers. The only way I can fail in prayer, the only way is don't say anything. Then I'm like, just say something. Don't even know what. Don't even know what. Just say something. Just say something. We pray, God, I love her. I want to marry her. I know that's my wife. Let me marry her. And the Holy Spirit says, whoa, 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 God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That means this is the only date he's been on in a year. She's the only one to say yes to him in the last year. They don't need a wife right now. They just need to be happy they're on a date. Just give them fun tonight. We pray, I hate you, God. And the Holy Spirit says, hold on, hold on, Father. They don't mean that. They don't mean hate. They mean they don't understand you right now, and they're just a little bit frustrated. Give them your peace. God, I need a husband. My biological clock is ticking. No, oh God, oh God, no, no, no. They don't need a husband. They need to fall more in love with you before they fall in love with any man. God, I need more money. Oh, no, 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 they don't. No, they don't. They don't need more money. 
They need to be a good steward of what they have and learn they could be generous in any situation they find themselves in. God, you better do something. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't even want to live anymore. No, no, God, they, they don't mean that. They don't mean that. They feel like they're on a merry-go-round that they'll never get off. Let them know that your answer will come quickly. I don't even care if they die. Holy Spirit says, no, they don't mean die. They don't mean die. Lord, they mean help them to forgive. They've been hurt and wounded, and they need to know how to better love you and better love the people in their life. God, I just want to go skiing. Why are there so many cars on I-70? <laughs> Holy Spirit says, God, what they really mean is thank you for the patience you're giving them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you as they're sitting in the Eisenhower Tunnel that they're just saying, thank you, Jesus, for the patience that they're having, okay? Thank you, thank you. God, I'm done with my marriage. Holy Spirit says, God, no, what they're saying is, God, teach me to love my wife as Christ loves the church. I can't take this anymore. No, Father, what they really mean is that they're at the end of their rope and what they need today is strength for today. Just give them your strength for today. My prayer will always come up short in words and emotions and power. It always does. That's the bad news. But the good news is it's not about the one praying. It's about the one we're praying to. And God will take our words and do something far beyond what we could ever imagine. God takes my simple prayer and adds his power to it. And when I put my prayer in his hands, then I'm in good shape. Are you all with me today? When I put my prayer in his hands, then we're in good shape. It all depends upon whose hand it's in. You put a basketball in my hand, it's worth $19. You put a basketball in LeBron James's hand, it's worth $75 million. It all depends on whose hand it's in. You put a baseball in my hand, it's worth $8. You put a baseball in Clayton Kershaw's hand, it's worth $19 million. It all depends on whose hand it's in. You put a tennis racket in my hand, it's worthless. You put a tennis racket in the hand of Roger Federer and Serena Williams, they'll win a French Open and a Wimbledon championship because it all depends on whose hand it's in. You put a stick in my hand and it might keep away some crazy Rottweiler. You put a stick in Moses' hand and he'll part the Red Sea so the people of Israel can be set free. It all depends on whose hand it's in. You put a slingshot in my hand and you got a kid's toy in my hand. You put a slingshot in King David's hand. It's a mighty weapon that knocks down the mighty giant and gives courage, courage and power to the Israelite army. It all depends on whose hand it's in. You put two fish and five loaves in my hand and you'll get two fish sandwiches. You put two fish and five loaves in the hand of Jesus and he will feed 5,000 people because it all depends on whose hand it's in. And you put a nail in my hand and it might produce a birdhouse, but you put a nail in the hands of Jesus Christ and he'll produce salvation for the entire planet. It all depends on whose hand it's in. And ladies and gentlemen, we are in his hands. Bad news, we don't know how to pray. Good news, he does. He does. My goal today was just to encourage your heart today. Just to encourage. I hate, I hate it when I'm myself and I see others who lose heart. How do we not lose heart? We just pray. How do we pray? Just participate. Just say something. Just say anything. Because the Holy Spirit within you will take those words and magnify them and take them to the Heavenly Father and he'll do beyond what we could think or imagine or believe. I'm gonna ask the band to come on up right now. Okay, I'm gonna ask the band to come on up. Band, are you coming up? You're a little slow today, okay? You gotta hurry, okay? Let's all stand together. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. If the greatest gift, well, there's so many, so I don't say the greatest. One of the enormous gifts we get when we come to, to faith, put our faith in God, is we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
And that Holy Spirit helps me to pray. Are you all with me? Helps me to pray, okay? And so if you don't, if you don't know God, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. So the greatest prayer you could pray today is this prayer right here. Just say it in your heart. And it won't be a good one because we don't know how to pray. But something like this. I admit I'm broken. Can't fix myself. It's as simple as A, B, and C. I admit I'm broken. Nothing can fix me. A project, the priest, the pastor. <laughs> Nothing can fix me. So I, I admit I'm broken. B means believe. I just believe that I can't fix myself, but Jesus can. Jesus can fix me. That's B. And C is, I commit myself, the word was Lord back then, but the word Lord means boss. So I commit myself to Jesus being my boss now. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I, I'm not the boss anymore. I admit I'm broken. I believe Jesus died for me and rose from the dead to forgive me and give me the Holy Spirit. Now I commit myself to him being the boss of my life. If you just agree with that prayer, you don't have to say it, just in your heart. If you just agree to that prayer and say, yeah, that's what I want in my life right now, bam! The Holy Spirit will come into your life right now. Right now, bam! He'll be right there. And the Bible calls him the helper. I, I couldn't have existed in this world without a helper. I can't tell you how many nights I go to bed with tears in my eyes, crying over situations and loved ones that I care about, some of you that I know are in tough situations. I don't know what to do, but the Holy Spirit helps me. It's one of the greatest gifts we have as a Christian. Okay? And for those of us who know Jesus, we have this awesome gift of the Holy Spirit that helps us to pray. And here's what I want you to know. That because you have that, the Holy Spirit is reminding us that Christ is enough. He's enough. All you need is Him. and He'll get you through. Christ is enough for me. I think I needed a better job, a better spouse, better this, better. Christ is enough for me. And because he's enough for me, I ain't turning back. I ain't going back. There ain't no turning back. Because I got a helper that's going to get me through no matter what mess I'm in. He's going to help me get through. Are you all with me today? Yeah. Folks, hey, no turning back. No turning back. Say that with me. No turning back. One more time. No, no turning back. You turning back, Dwayne? No turning back. No turning back. Kevin, what about you? You turning back? No way. Huh? No way. Good, good. Can I play that for you? No, no, no. Okay. No turning back. Okay. Lee, turning back? Tommy, what about you? No turning back. You know why we're not turning back? Because we have daunting stuff ahead of us. But Christ is enough for us. And the Holy Spirit will help me, help me, and give me things that I can't even think or imagine or believe. Father, thanks for being a great God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being so good. Today, I pray for all of us going through tough stuff, some of us going through good stuff, whatever it is, I pray that our heart will be encouraged because the bad news is we don't know how to pray, but the good news is you take our feeble, broken words, sometimes just groans, and your Holy Spirit takes them to the throne of our Heavenly Father and says, here's what my son really needs. Here's what my daughter really needs. And because we have that kind of power accessible to us, we declare today that Christ is enough and we're not turning back. And for that, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing together.